it can be seen by all who enter the house. For all the secrets will eventually be brought into the open, and everything that is concealed will be brought to the light and made known to all. So pay attention to how you hear. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even what they think they understand will be taken away from them. The true family of Jesus, verse 19. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they couldn't get him they couldn't get to him because of the crowd. Some told Jesus, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside, and they want to see you. Jesus replied, My mother and my brothers are all those who hear God's word and obey it. Jesus calms the storm. Sorry. Um, I'm just going to pause for a second. I am still feeling under the weather. And um, there's been a couple times where I've definitely felt that while reading today. So if I am sounding a bit off or I have been the last couple days, that is why I do ask you to pray for me. Um, uh, I'm going to jump back into this on verse 22. But just know, I'm starting not to feel super great while reading. Um... And uh, it's a little distracting, I will admit. All right. Uh, ooh. Uh, verse 22. Jesus calms the storm. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and started out. As they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap, but soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water, and they were in real danger. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown! When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. Suddenly, the storm, the storm stopped, and all was calm. Then he asked them, Where is your face. The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They asked each other. When he gives a command, even the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. Verse 26. So they arrived in the region of uh, Ger Gerasenes, across the lake from Galilee. As Jesus was climbing out of the boat, a man who was possessed by demons came out to meet him. For a long time he had been homeless and naked, living in the tombs outside the town. As soon as he saw Jesus, he shrieked and fell in front of him. And then he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? Please, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had already commanded the evil spirit to come out of him. The spirit had often taken control of the man, even when he had placed under guard and put in chains and shackles. He simply broke them and rushed out into the wilderness, completely under the demon's power. Jesus demanded, What is your name? Me, John, he replied, for he was filled with many demons. The, name it, the demons kept speaking and begging Jesus not to send them to the bottomless pit. There's a little star there. I want to know what that means. Uh, so verse 30, um, or the abyss or the underworld. All right. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby, and the demons begged him to let them enter the pigs. So Jesus gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the, the entire herd. 
plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw it, they fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside, spreading the news as they ran. People rushed out to see what had happened. A crowd soon uh, gathered around Jesus, and they saw the man who had been freed from the demons. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully clothed and perfectly sane, and they were all afraid. When those who had seen what happened told the others how the demon-possessed man had healed, and all the people of the region in the Gerasenes begged Jesus to go away and leave them alone, for a great wave of fear swept over them. So Jesus returned to the boat and left, crossing back to the other side of the lake. The man who had been freed from the demons begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him home, saying, No, go back to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. So he went all through the town, proclaiming the great things Jesus had done for him. Jesus heals in response to faith. Verse 40. On the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who had who was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffering for 12 years with consistent bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized that she could not uh, when the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her exclaim why she touched him, and she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While she was still speaking to her, uh, while he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told them, "Your daughter is dead. There is no use troubling the teacher now." But when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. She will be healed. When they arrived at the house, of, at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, John, and James, and the little girl's father and mother. Uh, the house was filled with people weeping and wailing. But he said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead. She's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him because they all knew she had died. Then Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, My child, get up! And at that moment, her life returned, and she immediately stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were overwhelmed, but Jesus insisted that they not tell anyone what had happened. May God add a blessing to the reading of Luke chapter 8. Um, there is a section in here, Luke chapter 8, uh, 22 to 25, Jesus answering life's eternal questions. Will everything be okay? So this is in reference to Jesus calming the storm. Uh, so Jesus is on a boat and in the middle of the sea with the men who are used to weathering storms on the open water. But in this case, the storm is severe enough to convince these experienced men that they're going to die. Jesus reacts to this dire situation by taking a nap. 
Why? Because he's sure everything's going to be okay. Not even the natural forces of the world that seem so uncontrollable and daunting to us have more power uh, than Jesus does. So they don't have more power than Jesus does. Uh, if a toddler came running up to you and promised to blow you over with one big puff, you might react in a mock fear, but you're not really afraid that a hurricane force wind is about to assault you. We know everything's going to be okay, not because we have everything together, but because we aren't uh, scared, scared of things in the world we have to face. What? Everything's okay. We have everything not because we have everything together and not because there aren't scary things in this world we have to face, but because we're attached to Jesus who's bigger than everything and anything we fear. Amen. Um, yeah. Things in this world are big, they're scary, but we are attached to Jesus and we trust that he is in control and that he is sovereign and he uh, is in the interest of good things. Um, then, you know, the sea, the, uh, one of the things that stood out to me is verse 14. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the cares and riches of, uh, and pleasures of this life. And the, so they will never grow into maturity. Um, that idea that, you know, it's these people that grow, but they don't have those deep roots. And that was one of those things that it did come up again in this, and it's just been one of those things that has stood out to me. But then the seed that fell on good soil represents honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word cling to it and patiently produce a huge harvest. I think that's interesting. Uh, and that like kind of good comparison between the two. If we get distracted by, you know, um, the cares and riches, riches and pleasures of life, uh, it will stunt our growth into maturity in Christ. Uh, and I thought that was kind of, that, that's interesting. But then we also have like Jesus talking in parables, telling stories to capture people's hearts, to go over and mull over and to think about. Uh, and these stories are meant to be like, take that home, think of it over. Uh, where do you fit into this story? And so on and so forth. So I like how Jesus does that. But then his disciples, he just goes, hey, plainly, here's where we are. And now the disciples also can look at this and be like, well, am I, what soil would I have been when I'm hearing Jesus speak? Am I actually the rich soil or am I the rocky soil? Am I this soil? Or am I that soil? Um, so it's an interesting thing. And what kind of soil are you? Then we have that true uh, family of Jesus. So there's two things in here, right? There's this is very focused on that spiritual side of things as are a couple of the other things in this chapter. And it's, you know, the true family of Christ is that spiritual side of things. So his flesh and blood, blood like, you know, physical lineage family, his mom and his brothers. Yes, Jesus had brothers. Um, one of them even wrote a book in the Bible. Um, you know, are outside and they're trying to get to him. But, you know, this isn't about the physical family. This is about that spiritual family and that focus on that spiritual family. So it's kind of cool. We get insight into Jesus and his, like, earthly family, but then how he invites us into that spiritual family. Then we have Jesus, Jesus coming the storm. We talked about that. Jesus healing the demon-possessed guy, I think, is also very interesting. So once again, we have that spiritual authority that's really coming through. And when Jesus heals them, the reactions of the people are fear and, like, just leave us. We were okay with this guy's suffering because we could, you know, do whatever and we knew how to work around it. But 
now, you know, his freedom costs, you know, all those pigs and who knows what other things you're going to free us from that's going to cost us things that we're not prepared to do. Leave us. We're, we're, we're afraid. You're, you have power and authority that we don't understand and leave us. Meanwhile, that guy is healed. He is safe. He's no longer a nuisance to the community. Like, people saw him and, like, they tried to chain him up and everything and he just overpowered the chains and busted everything free. And you have this guy essentially really torturing this countryside, but it was like, we know this. We can live with this, even though, you know, it's dangerous. And then we have Jesus freeing them from the danger and them being even more afraid of that freedom. Uh, and one of the things that that makes me think of in our life, when we're struggling with God and freedom and all that jazz, um, you know, a lot of us struggle with that idea of, of sins being forgiven. Um, some of us struggle with that idea on what will it really mean if this sin isn't the one controlling my life anymore? Am I actually ready to be free and not just have the sinful side of me be a part of things? Am I ready to take account and to like actually realize my sin? It's a difficult thing. One of the, but even like growing in goodness, there's this movie coach Carter and it quotes somebody, and I can't remember who the quote is from. I'm sorry, you can probably look it up right afterwards, or even when I say it, you're going to be like, oh yeah, that's that guy. But it's, our greatest fear isn't that we are incapable, but uh, we are um, more, our, our, it's not that we're powerless, but that we are powerful beyond measure. And that idea of freedom and hope and goodness is something that like really traps us. And then lastly, we have Jesus heals in response to faith. And this woman that just comes to Jesus, touches uh, him and just hopes that maybe, maybe Jesus can do something. She brings her burdens to Christ and Christ, you know, just out of reaction heals her. It's like, who is it? And then she receives the healing and she is fearful, like, oh, it's me. But was I worthy to do that? Was I allowed to do that? Did I just went to like the greatest teacher and I, you know, did all of this stuff. And Jesus' response isn't like, you know, how dare you or whatever. It's your faith has healed you. We can come to God with anything, any shame. And her bleeding for like all those years would have been... Like, she's unclean, she's not allowed to be touched, she's not, like, there's a lot of rules and regulations against that type of stuff, especially in that day and age. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons for her to be like, I sinned by even coming over here, by being around people. I caused others to sin by my presence and coming to God. Is this okay? And then, you know, she gets healed and she's, yes! Oh no, what have I done? And Jesus says, no, you came to me. You came to me and you got healed. That, that, that's worth it. Coming to Jesus and being healed. And sometimes when we start making those choices to bring our junk towards God, um, it can put those around us into these really weird camps. Uh, families sometimes we'll get really angry. Some of our friends might not understand and it'll cause them to maybe even make fun of God, make fun of us, whatever the case may be, but it's still worthwhile. And others will be like, Shh, God can't forgive you. Don't you know how much of a sinner you are? And you're like, yeah, I do. So does God. And he wants to forgive me. It's like, yeah, amen, that's exciting. Yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, let's pray. AJC, awesome, Jesus Christ, I thank you for your displays throughout this chapter of Luke. Um, for, you know, that spiritual authority that even though this is all just, you know, the facts and how Luke 
tells a story. It's just fact after fact after fact. And your spiritual authority is just coming through clear and your love is coming through clear. How you conducted yourself is just coming through, even though the drama of a lot of these situations is just kind of stripped down to the bare facts. And yet, Lord, your authority and your love comes shining through. I thank you so much for that. I thank you for having uh, women of all sorts follow you from, you know, the former prostitute to demon possessed women, but like women were a part of what you did as you moved forward. And I thank you for that, that it wasn't just a men's club, but it was women from all different sorts and social statuses and stuff like that, along with men. Um, I thank you for the parable of the seed where we can enter, where we can look inwardly and be like, okay, do I have to clean up the soil that is my life to grow those deep roots? Um, and that you gave us that answer so that we don't have to guess and mull it over, but that we can know the plan, know, know what you're saying, and then really just think about how that applies to us. I thank you for that reminder of the lamp that we want your hope and your love to shine out from amongst us everywhere, your love and your hope. And help, help that to happen, Lord, despite us and in spite of us. Have your hope and your love shine through us. I thank you for, for that reminder on that spiritual family that we are invited into that your spiritual family, Lord. Um, for the, the display that even nature, the things that seem completely uncontrollable in this life are still controlled by you and how you healed the demon-possessed man even though it caused fear and tribulation in so many others. I thank you that your healing surpasses our fears. And Lord, we are destined to do great things um, because you're going to work through us. And let that not be something that scares us, but something that excites us and motivates us. And Lord, I thank you that you heal despite our sin and despite what the world says. That you free us and you welcome us. So, Lord, help us to act justly. Help us to love mercy. And help us to walk humbly with you, Lord. Uh, I pray for healing from whatever it is that's making me feel um, off. And uh, for those that are sick today and, you know, that are feeling the same thing that I am, I, I pray for them. And those that are much, much worse because there's a lot of illnesses that are worse than what I have right now. Uh, I lift them up. And, uh, yeah. Lord, thank you so much for all this and so much more. Lift it up in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, thank you guys very much. Once again, have a fantastic day. God bless.